Welcome everyone. We're at Black Hat day two of Black Hat 2019. Uh, and I'm very excited about this interview because we get to talk about firmware, which is our audience knows is one of my passions to talk about and nerd out about firmware. Uh, and with me to do that is Yuri Bulligan. He's the founder and CEO of Eclipsium. Yuri, welcome. Um, hi, Paul. Thanks for having me here. Yes, yeah, nice to have you here. So uh, for our audience, Yuri, I know you and I have chatted before, and I love what you guys are doing. But for our audience, describe the problem that you solve. Um, absolutely. Uh, well, if we 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 uh, hear a lot about this software problem, software vulnerabilities, malware, ransomware, and if we take any device, there's a lot of software. There's operating system, applications, um, all of them have vulnerabilities, can be exploited, malware can get introduced on the device, but software is just the topmost layer, mm -hmm. and if you look at each device, you have hard drive. It has its own operating system, its own software stack, network mm -hmm. stack, well, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, network cards, same thing. It has its own operating system, its own software inside of it. Uh, the BIOS, UEFI, embedded controllers, baseboard management controllers and servers that um, kind of manage... Uh, or provide lights out management of those uh, servers and data centers. And largely these are all firmware that um, exist on these specific yep. pieces of hardware, right? Firmware in a sense that the kernel operating system file system is all bundled together and lives on this devi device yeah. inside the computer. Generally they have their own OS, their own code, a lot of code, millions of lines of code mm -hmm. that manufactured by or developed by uh, manufacturers of those components and all of that is kind of embedded into those components, and that's right. what, yeah, what firmware is. Typically not like so Linux or something, like it's firmware that we think about that we'd put on different devices, right? It's proprietary firmware, essentially. Yes, uh, can be uh, can be Linux-based, mm -hmm. can can uh, can be based on um, other um, uh, other operating systems, yep. uh, or can be completely proprietary. But there's just a lot of it. If you take just one component, uh, let's say UEFI, in a, that goes into it, any laptop, mm -hmm. any server. Um, it's not a monolith monolithic piece of firmware. It generally has like 300 to 600 executables inside of it. Wow. Implementing full network stack. It's like the un sorts of undiscovered attack surface, right? As you describe just how much code and uh, how many applications are on there, it's a huge attack surface. And that's just one component you're yep. referring to. It absolutely is... Uh, a very large attack surface comparable to the entire attack surface of the whole uh, um, uh, software stack on each device. Um, and um, um, this is just one component, but if you take uh, a server, it can have up to 100 components yeah. like that. Right, right. And I think what also people may just not have considered and are thinking like old school, typically when we updated the BIOS, for example, we needed physical access to the system. And I, I truly believe that there is kind of that notion today that well i don't need to worry about the security because well someone would have to be physically there but you fast forward to today the operating system has access to all of these hardware components and their firmware and software running on them mostly uh, absolutely and uh, and the reason is that because firmware is so complex uh, the uh, manufacturers of uh, those devices mm -hmm. they need an ability to patch uh, bugs in that firmware to patch security bugs in mm -hmm. that firmware so they need an ability to install updates uh, through the operating system, sometimes remotely uh, through other mechanisms. So there are plenty of um, uh, ways to update firmware exists on every device. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of those mechanisms aren't as secure. Some of them lack any security whatsoever. For example, signatures over those firmware updates. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a yes. still a common place. And uh, this is how, um, this is how malware and uh, attackers are um, getting into the firmware. And I think that's the other misconception is that, well, we've heard about these firmware attacks for a while and, you know, no one was really doing that, but that's obviously not. You folks found some, some pretty interesting malware uh, specimens that were running around on firmware, right? Well, absolutely. There are, uh, there are implants that exist for different um, types of firmware. Mm -hmm. uh, UFI is one of them, but there are implants that exist for firmware on other devices. And wha what was the, the kind of popular one that you guys were talking about uh, in attack um, more recently? 
One more recent one uh, that comes to mind is Lojax yes. implants mm -hmm. that was infecting UEFI. Uh, that was discovered in the wild. Um, it was used by Sednet, um, by uh, APT28 group. Um, uh, it's an interesting piece of malware because um, um, it's not the new type of um, uh, implant like that. Mm -hmm. We've seen um, uh, UEFI implants before mm -hmm. from hacking team and uh, there are indications for um, uh, implants that were attacking MacBook EFI um, yep, yep. firmware um, from Vault 7 disclosures like Dark Matter uh, and the Sonic Screwdriver. Mm -hmm. But this was discovered in the wild as part of a campaign um, and um, uh, it was exploiting a vulnerability mm -hmm. to get into the UFI and infect uh, UFI firmware. And the reason it was doing is to get persistence, persistence right. because even when you re-image the operating system or you do any detection within the operating system uh, or you do any incident response, mm -hmm. um, Lojax could still reinfect the OS after reinstall and mm -hmm. bypass those um, those measures, those right. detection. And, and it's a, uh, the UEFI has basically unrestricted access to the operating system. Absolutely. Right? Which I think is an important point yep. that many not, can not consider. It doesn't matter what OS protections, like you said, are in place. It can just still reimplant itself. Absolutely, it has full control over the uh, entire operating system, mm -hmm. entire software stack on a device, uh, including um, hypervisor and um, DMM. For example, if you take Windows 10, mm -hmm. which has a, a really great uh, security architecture uh, based on the uh, virtualization-based security, based on a kind of a special um, you know, version of a Hyper-V underneath it. Um, the UFI implants bypass all of that, mm -hmm. including all the capabilities that are based on that virtualization-based security um, and any other protection that is really um, uh, that is really implemented and enforced in the software. For right. example, we all think that BitLocker is a hardware technology, but the reality is BitLocker is really a, a software-based mm -hmm. uh, full disk encryption. It works with the TPM trusted platform module in order to um, kind of um, uh, in order to protect from evil made type of attacks against the bitloaders. But right, if right. you have an implant in the UFI, mm -hmm. then you can still introduce that evil made attack against the bitlocker and then capture the uh, the pin or the passwords that user entered. Now, given the risks that we just spoke about and the uh, you know capabilities this gives you, the fact that we've seen it in the wild means that everyone's updating their firmware today, right? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> That's your goal, maybe, right? Yeah. Maybe, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe we'll um, we'll um, um, we'll have some influence on that. But this is absolutely the first uh, thing that uh, we need to um, establish as mm -hmm. an industry. Uh, it's the first. Um, it's a basic hygiene. Right. Uh, we do that in software. There's so much firmware. We have to do that in the firmware as well. Right. And. I I have a lot of theories, but I want to hear from you. Why don't pe more people pay attention to this and include it in their regular patching cycles? It's a, uh, it's a bit more complicated because uh, there are many vendors of devices. They have their own uh, update capabilities. Mm -hmm. Then there are different uh, devices on each a system, on each uh, laptop and server. Mm -hmm. Those have their own tools and methods to update firmware on them. So there are hundreds of just the update tools. And some of those update tools also have some pretty serious vulnerabilities. Was um, it the Lenovo patched a vulnerability not that long ago? Uh, the update tools are great entry to um, uh, for attackers. Uh, mm -hmm. Most recently, I think the Shadow Hammer campaign uh, mm -hmm. that was um, that was uh, targeting Asus uh, live update utility yep. that was delivering firmware updates on um, Asus systems. Mm. Um, but uh, absolutely, uh, um, update utilities um, are an important vector because their mm. whole purpose is to update the firmware. Is to interact so with that firmware, yeah. right. So, yeah, so that's any one way in. Yeah. Uh, also, I think people don't like think about it. Like they've got so much on their plate. They're like, I'm struggling to keep my apps, my operating system up to date. Things go wrong. I'm just going to wipe it. Now you're adding on top of that. How do they manage all of these different subsystems uh, together? And and that's what I love about your solution, quite frankly, to cut to the chase, <laughs> is that it gives you that one unified platform um, that is important for security, but also for you know general operations, right? I mean, it, having that visibility into what firmware is running? Uh, is it the latest version? Are there bugs? Is there security uh, issues? Right, and that's what uh, absolutely. Build. And um, 
you know, IT security teams and organizations, they're swamped with all sorts of things. And the uh, last thing they want is to try to find all of those hundred update utilities for mm -hmm. firmware components on uh, all of their assets that they have in their infrastructure and uh, learn how to use them mm -hmm. uh, to update the firmware. Uh, so what we, um, 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 what we are uh, hopefully um, uh, solving is, um, is uh, taking that complex area and simplifying that mm -hmm. for uh, for people who are tasked to protect their uh, organizations, uh, simplifying by providing a, a, a one way to uh, see the versions of the firmware, see what mm -hmm. they have, in, wh what they have in the uh, in, in their devices, right? Um, do including they, do they have to put an agent? I, I can't I can't remember now when we did the uh, when we chatted last. Is is there an agent and agentless option? Uh, absolutely, we support okay. both. Yeah, um, that's what I thought. They can they can run all the time and uh, monitor each device mm -hmm. um, in real time, uh, or they can just scan device um, uh, when. Um, and then on re it removes itself hoc. from the system, right? Once yeah, it, it does absolutely. It. Yeah, I gotcha. Now the other thing that I like is even if you use those update tools, some or all of them from the manufacturers, you're not going to gain visibility into has my firmware already been trojan from the manufacturer or an attacker you know, after the fact. And that is a benefit of your platform. It's gonna tell me wha about those conditions that maybe I've got some firmware that has already been, um, has malware inside of it. Uh, yes, because uh, uh, you know, uh, doing basic hygiene in firmware is step one, mm -hmm. but once you uh, once you ensure that the firmware is patched, or sometimes you may not want to patch some uh, firmware mm -hmm. on your critical assets because you don't want uh, server downtime or, or right. so. Uh, but it, um, once that hygiene is in place, um, or you kind of uh, make the uh, risk-based decision uh, not to patch, then you want to monitor uh, those devices if they have been really implanted, mm -hmm. if they have been compromised. Um, uh, in uh, one of those uh, dozens of firmware components. Mm -hmm. uh, again, either in the supply chain or when a uh, device is traveling uh, to or working out of remote location or um, just as part of the operation, um, you know, targeted by a, a campaign that uses mm -hmm. uh, firmware implants for persistence, uh, like, uh, like Lojax. So um, absolutely, this is uh, this is our goal to um, to ensure that those devices have not been compromi compromised and uh, or tampered. Can you do that in a, in a couple different ways? There's like a signature matching, obviously, um, but then you can also look inside some of that firmware and determine if there's components in there that indicate a compromise. Correct? Uh, yes, we do look uh, inside each firmware component mm -hmm. um, and also hardware components, mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the uh, uh, effective mechanisms is uh, uh, for the firmware is to apply whitelisting, because firmware is uh, isn't like software that um, you know users install their applications right, inside yeah, firmware. Yeah. They they generally don't, and so firmware is relatively static mm -hmm. from that perspective, and so uh, we can uh, we can ensure that all of the firmware components. Uh, they have been really developed by the manufacturer of the device or right. that component. Even um, if they're not signing their firmware, you can still basically uh, hash absolutely. it right into yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and of course, uh, of course, um, um, we can apply other techniques like static analysis, yep. like yep. behavioral analysis of uh, how the hardware behaves, mm -hmm. um, and also detect um, I known IOCs of known uh, known threats. Yep. That's all fantastic. of that applies, just like in the software, all of that applies to the firmware world. That's awesome. If folks uh, want to learn more and uh, get a demo or a trial, uh, how do they do that? Uh, the best way is uh, our website, Eclipsium.com, um, and um, I'm uh, happy to um, connect. That's awesome. Yeah, I've, I've seen the demo. It's really, it's really fabulous. You guys have done a Thank great job. Both. Great job. And I hope our audience goes and checks it out because I feel like this is – one of the sleeping giants that like when not as many people are paying attention to this as I believe they should. So it is the biggest gap in, uh, in, uh, in the security today, I believe. Awesome. Yuri, thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me.